Bonjour. Nous sommes ici à Paris Retail Week. Mais je parle français, mais je parle anglais. OK. Hello. Welcome to Paris Retail Week. It's a very exciting event. There's thousands of people here from all over the world. And um, I'm delighted to be talking to Richard Lynn from Retail Economics from London. Welcome. Thank you. So we partnered with you a few weeks ago. And we spent a lot of time talking and understanding about the change in retail and how that landscape is changing. Yeah. Not just in the UK, but around the world, but predominantly in the UK. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about what that research is saying mm -hmm. and how it's changing our perception and our expectations of retail. Sure, thank you. Um, now we were delighted to do this piece of research for Freedom Pay and what we really wanted to do was understand the landscape, the payments landscape, understand the integration of technology, better understand how, how that's changed the custo customer journey and how that customer journey also differs between different consumer cohorts depending on levels of affluence, depending on age, depending on different regions, depending on different verticals within retail as well, to really build up a much better understanding of how that's going to affect retailers and what they need to do in order to respond to this evolving landscape. And so to draw on some of the research, one of the things just at a very helicopter level that we wanted to understand is actually what does payments look like when you break it down into traditional forms of plastic, um, cash, and of course now digital wallets and, and, and other, and within the other space there's things like buy now, pay it later, and, uh, and, and other forms of payment. Um, and one of the you know, super interesting findings is that we've seen, we, we expect to see a huge acceleration in the digital wallet um, adoption. So when we talk about digital wallets, what, what do you mean? Define that just, just before we dive in. Let's sure. What do we mean by digital wallet? So essentially this is um, a traditional wallet, as you might say, you know, a physical wallet, but in a digital sense on a smartphone, on a wearable device. Most people might relate this to Apple Pay or Google Pay, how you would essentially pay for a transaction, but also the integration of other things. Tickets for hospitality or events, uh, loyalty cards, but a place where people can store a lot of digital data, transactional data, and other forms of data as well. Gotcha, okay. So on a typical customer journey where this is relevant, you'd get to the point of checkout and you might double click on your smartphone and pay seamlessly. And of course, there's a lot of integration with that now in terms of loyalty and things. So the proportion that we actually pay with digital wallets today in the UK is around 17%. Um, and at the moment, cash is slightly higher than that, around 18.8%. But interestingly, even within that 17% for digital wallets, there's a huge variation by age and affluence, and we can get onto that in a bit more detail. But essentially, we see this huge adoption, especially by younger cohorts, especially by more affluent um, user groups as well. We expect to see that grow from around 17% in 23 to over a quarter in the next five years. But by 2033, so within the next 10 years, what we expect is to see that digital wallets will become the primary channel of payments across retail, hospitality, and leisure. And it's at this point, really importantly, within that 10-year period, it's at that point where we expect to see digital wallets actually overtake the tipping point of where it will overtake traditional plastics, plastic payments. And cash, like, dropped by half. And cash dropped by half, exactly. And some of that is going to be driven by consumer adoption. Most of it would be driven by consumer adoption, where, as I was saying, younger cohorts are demanding more from these types of technologies. They're demanding more from retailers, from brands. They're asking for more integrated services with digital wallets, and some of that might be around buy now, pay later options or, um, or loyalty. So driven by consumer adoption, driven specifically by the least, uh, the, the, the most affluent and the younger cohorts, but also driven by merchants and vendors as well. 
So if you look at the hospitality space in the UK, then there are company, there are um, restaurants, Prezzo, Ask, two examples where actually they don't take cash anymore. So if you're going to eat in these restaurants, then you need to pay by digital um, means. Um, a lot of that's on digital wallets, and even some services. So some of the lo some local authorities have moved away from being able to pay with contactless and cash for um, for parking, where the only form of paying for parking is actually now on a uh, on on an app on a smartphone. So there's going to be you know a number of different moving parts, but the the, the shift firmly towards digital wallets. Okay. The other, so, and then when we, then we kind of start peeling back some of the layers of the research, we saw this real clear polarization between affluence and age. And so what you've got on the, on the y-axis is the least affluent 40% at the bottom and the most affluent 40% at the top. And then as you move from left to right, you've got younger groups under 35s and over 55s. And so what we can clearly see with this is that, and, and this is specific to using digital wallets in a physical environment, actually. And so what you can clearly see from this is that people who are using digital wallets today will expect to continue to use them. And this is most prevalent across, you know, that kind of penetration is most prevalent across young and the most affluent. So you've got already got two thirds of consumers that say, yes, we use digital wallets in physical environments, but that falls to 25% for the over 55s and for, um, for uh, the least affluent as well. So you've got this picture that emerges and the research goes into a lot more detail into um, how that then differs between other, uh, you know, other, other cohorts and, and, and other parts of the retail sector as well. Do you think there's a suggestion that there is a growing intent to use them as well with the older generation? Yes. You're seeing that in the data? Yes, absolutely. So part of the research we then go on to unpick whether or not consumers feel like they will do more of their uh, transactions using digital wallets. And also asking for those who don't use digital wallets currently, do they expect to use them in the future? And actually, we, yeah, we, we, we see that with the data showing that the, even the people that are not using it today, a large proportion of them, again, typically some of the younger, younger um, cohorts of consumers, are intending to use them in the future. There are some, let's call it kind of like stubborn traditionalists um, who, um, who say they will never use digital wallets at all. Um, but again, they are typically older consumers and there are some barriers around here, barriers around trust and, um, and that's kind of limiting their, the rates of adoption within cert with, uh, in particular across the older age groups, so there's an element of trust here where they're um, a bit apprehensive about using the technology, about having payment details stored um, with, within smartphones, on smartphones. There's definitely an educational piece as well. And so some consumers are saying, you know, what happens if I don't have phone reception? What happens if I don't have Wi-Fi access? What happens if I, my, my battery goes dead? So on the Wi-Fi and the phone access front, you, you, know, you don't need to have a Wi-Fi connection to be able to use your digital wallet. So there's an education piece here where people don't really understand the technology, don't understand where it works, and that's capable. But that will change. But will that change. will absolutely change, yeah. And, and you can see that dynamic changing already. And you can see lots of the work that you guys do, doing the education piece. You see retailers as well. Um, pushing out some of that messaging to make it easier and integrating um, the digital wallets, uh, integra integrating the functionality within digital wallets around loyalty, around membership pricing as well, being another one, around buy now, pay later, and other, other services. Um, so people are beginning to appreciate that it's not just a form of payments, but there's lots of other um, Functionality, yeah, parts of functionality that are, that, that are supporting delivering a more cohesive customer journey that touches kind of physical and digital together. Interesting. And then, final slide, just to touch on um, for today's presentation, is just around that barrier and getting over that initial barrier of setting up a digital wallet and then whether or not that becomes a sticky behavior. 
And so we saw... Are the they going to love it or are they going to hate it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and also, is, is there a trigger? Has there been a trigger for someone to actually get past that initial barrier to set up a dig digital wallet? And then once they have done it, will they then will there be a permanent change in their behavior? The pandemic, of course, had an enormous impact on the way that we shop, the way we interacted with brands, our payments, and people and, and retailers were really pushing for contactless payments. In the UK, the threshold for contactless payments um, rose quite considerably. And so for lots of consumers, that was a shock, a shock in the way that they engaged within the industry. And for some, that, that was a step change in terms of how the proportion that they spent on digital wallets or contactless. And so within the research, we, we asked this question about once you've actually set up your digital wallet, then will you then go back to using plastics? And again, something that really clear that came out was that correlation between young, affluent. And so the youngest groups were the ones that said, once I've set up my digital wallet, used it, experienced the convenience of it, the, kind of like the frictionless customer journey, I won't then go back to using um, traditional, more traditional forms of payment. And you can see that across all of the different age groups, but the youngest has the highest correlation. Middle-aged um, consumers then say, yes, there is a correlation there. And again, you can see the correlation from least to most across the different age groups. But it's the older consumers that are a bit more resistant to change and a bit more um, apprehensive about embracing the kind of technology. Let's unpack this a little bit. Is at the show, there's a lot of, lot of um, narrative around omni-channel, paying omni. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the assumption being that if you're seeing more usage of digital wallets, that's just going to lead to an explosion of more omni-channel possibilities. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on where do you see this going for the world of retailers? You know, what mm -hmm. do they need to start thinking about if they haven't already? Yeah, sure. Um, I completely agree with that. And the way that consumers now shop, I mean, first of all, consumers don't shop in channels. They want to get to purchase a product in as frictionless a way as possible, by and large. And they will bounce between physical and digital channels on that path to purchase in the way that they, the way that they want to do it. And that kind of the merging between physical and digital is almost indistinguishable in some points. The smartphone and digital wallets are providing a means, a kind of a cohesive glue that stitches that bouncing around from physical to digital in an omni-channel manner. And so, and this is going back to the point where consumers are embracing the technology, generally, on the whole, particularly younger consumers, and they're asking for more integrated technology, more convenience, loyalty built in, different payment methods within, uh, within the overall digital wallet. From a, from a retailer and merchant point of view, there's a clear drive towards this as well, towards omni-channel, but also the use of digital wallets. They want to put customers at the very heart of their business. They want to understand. They have to. They have to if they want to survive. Absolutely. Adapt or die. Absolutely. And so they, uh, but, but data, you know, data is the key to all of this. And to have more data about their customers that they can generate through apps, through digital wallets, through digital payments, and then utilizing and driving much more sophisticated insights out of their data, um, making sure that they can offer personalization. And so some of that might be around personalized offers, personalized recommendations, um, but all born from having much better visibility of their customers and better use of data. You talk about the glue and this kind of changing in the back end sort of systems. So from a marketing standpoint, why is that important? Why should I care as a, a marketeer 
mm. when it comes to this change in technology? How is it going to change and enable my world? Adapt or die, <laughs> I think you said. <laughs> so I'll repeat that back to you. But it is certainly, certainly that, because the most sophisticated retailers are leveraging the technology to ultimately drive better lifetime value from their customers. And if they can understand their customers, they understand um, what they're buying and the characteristics. So I was with one of our clients last week talking exactly about this and actually touching on our research. And, uh, and they were saying they've got over a thousand different characteristics that they look at in terms of what they buy, when they buy it, is it online, is it offline, how old are they, what's the region? And they're using all of these different data touch points to drive a better understanding of their customers, use more personalized marketing and communication. But ultimately, you know, the objective here is to drive and enhance the lifetime value of customers. And if they can understand that if a customer buys into denim, then actually the next best action isn't necessarily to push them over to lingerie, it's to push them over to summer dresses if it's the right time of the year. They've got that data to be able to nudge them in the right direction using data to be able to drive and enhance the lifetime value of customers and knowing what to do in the right order to increase their propensity to spend within certain categories. Given what you're saying, let's just dive into that a little bit more and unpack that a little bit more from a loyalty and rewards perspective. Would you then say that the whole notion of loyalty and rewards is going to gain momentum mm. in time given the fact that retailers are going to have to understand their consumers better, offer better customer satisfaction. Yeah. The two perhaps seem to go hand in hand. Would you say that there could well be an explosion of loyalty rewards mm -hmm. if retailers get it right? And I think that's if retailers, if retailers get it right. Right. And consumers want value. They want to feel like they're being valued. They want to have offers and promotions that are relevant to them, relevant to their lifestyle, relevant to the kinds of products that they're interested in. And so as retailers get better and more sophisticated at this and offer more relevant um, product recommendations, more relevant promotions, then ultimately that's of more value to the customer. And then there's this exchange that customers go through in terms of, am I willing to give up my data? Am I willing to use the loyalty card or, or loyalty uh, And there's a suggestion they will if they feel that the reward is relevant, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So there's that exchange of I'm willing to, to, um, to give share, you my my data, data share my data if I can get something of value as an equitable exchange. And so as retailers become better at doing this, I think from a consumer perspective, there's going to be the willingness to share data because there's actually something of valuable that comes at the end of that. I'm going to ask you, this might be a controversial question, but why are they not doing it today? What mm. are they doing that is wrong? Like you talk about sophistication, mm. so I'm now saying, well, are they unsophisticated? Are they untargeted? Are they mm, yeah. just enable? Is the technology legacy? Like, w yeah. what do you feel is the, the stickiness? It's, it, it's difficult. It's tough. There's lots of retailers that talk an omni-channel game, but in reality, they operate across digital and physical. Silos. They're a multi-channel retailer, multi-channel, two channels that are siloed. They don't talk to each other. They don't have a single customer view. They don't have, they're not, they haven't built in digital into the operating system, so they don't have a single stock view. They can't do things like ship from store. If they receive some, if they, if someone orders something online and brings it back into store, there's complications with getting it back into the supply chain. So one of the questions that, that I, perhaps didn't answer earlier, so, you know, the other reason retailers have to do this 
is because they need to drive operational efficiency. And if you look at retailers' profitability over the last decade, it is pretty much, with, if you look at the top 150 retailers in the UK over the last 10 years, pre-tax profit margins have pretty much halved, gone from about 9% to about 4.5% over the last 10 years. And so there's a, there's a huge drive for driving operational efficiency, using technology to understand better data, uh, to, to, to understand the data better, and then using that to drive um, uh, a, a better understanding of their customers, enhance the customer value. But that efficiency and productivity piece is, is another absolutely critical part of it as well. And, and knowing what you know now with the data, what would be your advice to um, marketers, to retailers per se? What would be your advice knowing what we know now? Knowing what we know now, yeah. And um, where it could be going in 10 years time? I think the, re the real advice for retailers is that they cannot stand still. And even though there are pressures on their profit margins, um, the outlook and the backdrop for consumers is potentially one where it looks a bit, you know, the headwinds are quite strong for the consumer sector. They cannot, they cannot afford to stand still. And so it's the balance between cost cutting and protecting profitability versus investing, continuing to invest in their digital transformation. Because if they do not invest in their digital transformation, they will be left behind. And the pace of techno technological adoption is increasing at s so rapidly that the digital leaders of today who have got these systems in place could soon be the followers of tomorrow because there's been an explosion of these types of technologies, whether that's some of that might be around AI and the use of AI, um, but just more generally, the barriers to entry to adopting some of, this, uh, some of these technologies um, have become much lower now. And so there's a risk that smaller, more nimble, mid-sized retailers that are more vertically specialists or specialists um, can really ramp up their game quite quickly. And that, that's the risk. That is a really um, direct message, I think. You've got to invest now or, to Richard's point, be risk, risk being left behind, right? You've got to act now. Richard Lim, thank you very much for your time. Super, super interesting. Great, great research. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.